In 2006, curator Duncan Bull stated that, quote, what unites Rembrandt and Caravaggio in their very different worlds of Protestant Holland and Counter-Reformation Italy is the success of their quest to find pictorial solutions to express the great themes of humanity. The exhibition Rembrandt Caravaggio, organized by the Rijksmuseum Amsterdam that year, sought to revive the artistic parity granted to Caravaggio and Rembrandt in the 18th century. This exhibition, the first to bring together works of the Rembrandt of Italy and the Caravaggio from beyond the Alps, aimed to recover those characteristics common to the two artists, emphasizing both painters' matchless realism and consummate handling of light and dark to create works of deep emotional penetration. While the dominant view remains that the artists are united principally by the employment of strong chiaroscuro, curator Duncan Bull briefly considers that Rembrandt's paintings display, quote, an uncertainty or ambiguity as to the actual subjects that is not dissimilar to that surrounding Caravaggio's. This claim is here advanced further. Ambiguity, not merely chiaroscuro, is a unifying characteristic of Rembrandt and Caravaggio's paintings. By analyzing and comparing the artist's construction of narrative in their first versions of the Supper Emmaus, in light of the religious context of their creation, this study examines Duncan's perception that the artists, from their respective climates of Protestant Holland and Counter-Reformation Italy, can be united by their quest to find pictorial solutions to express the great themes of humanity, one of which is ambiguity. He argues that only the viewer can resolve the ambiguity of these two paintings and their fluctuation between revelation and obscurity, presence and absence. Both Caravaggio and Rembrandt return to represent the gospel story of the Supper at Emmaus more than once, to which ambiguity is intrinsic. St. Luke narrates, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them, assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. In this account, ambiguity is rooted in the disciples' failure to recognise Christ and tell his revelation as the divine presence in the bread. Divine ambiguity is also tacit in the disciples' ability to sense Christ in the burning of their hearts, though they remain incapable of perceiving him as a visible presence. The inherent ambiguity of this gospel account and Christ's mysterious nature are most successfully made manifest in both artists' first rendition of the narrative. Caravaggio's 1601 Supper Emmaus, now at the National Gallery in London, and Rembrandt's circa 1628 version at the Musée Jacques Mar Entre in Paris. While Caravaggio's painting compositionally attends to Luke's narrative, Lorenzo Pericolo discusses how it is an quote, unheard of kind of pictorial narrative that structurally incorporates ambivalence and subjectivity. Christ is placed centrally at the table alongside the two disciples, and raises his hand in a gesture of blessing. However, the conventionally bearded Christ is replaced with a beardless youth, and a fourth figure is also included, 
an innkeeper who looks on at Christ, seemingly oblivious to the divine revelation. Rembrandt's version, in contrast, presents a starkly silhouetted profile of the main subject. Light emanates from Christ, rendering the seated disciples' recognition unmistakable. The second disciple kneels at Christ's feet, completely submerged in darkness. In both paintings, Christ is portrayed outside the iconographic norm. Rembrandt's use of chiaroscuro and Caravaggio's transformation of Christ's face into a beardless, mask-like perfection conceived a figure perched on the boundary between revelation and concealment, creating uncertainty over the narrative moment depicted. This paper explores the significance of these visual and temporal ambiguities for the exegesis of the Emmaus narrative. In Rembrandt's Supper Emmaus, Christ simultaneously appears to emerge from and disappear into darkness. Either Christ reveals his identity by virtue of the disciples' recognition, or this revelation has already occurred and Christ is vanishing. Pericolo points out how Christ seems to disappear while breaking the bread on his lap, and as the apostle kneels at his feet, recognizing him, quote, even before the epiphany is completely fulfilled. Comparably, Caravaggio's Christ makes a single gesture of blessing, but the bread in front of him is already broken. The outstretched arms of the right disciple, who has traditionally been identified as Cleopas, and the frozen, clenched pose of the left disciple indicate that recognition is taking or has taken place, generating the same temporal ambivalence. Concurrently, the innkeeper remains composed. His expression remains oblivious and unaware of the occurring miracle. Such temporal ambiguities are harder to find in the artist's subsequent painted version of the same narrative, either in Caravaggio's 1606 version or Rembrandt's 1648 painting. In both later versions, Christ, his disciples and the innkeeper are depicted around the table engaged totally and exclusively in the moment of Christ's blessing. The artists no longer rely on vivid gestures to highlight the disciples' shock at the divine revelation. In Rembrandt's 1648 painting, the disciples react to Christ in more serene astonishment, as also implied by the soft aura of light around Christ's head. Christ himself gazes upwards, suggesting a more spiritual and less forceful theophany. Caravaggio's second version equally favours a much more contemplative atmosphere. All additional details, objects and colour have been removed to maintain only the essential, with Christ's gesture of blessing remaining the painting's absolute focal point. The traditional, easily recognisable bearded Christ has returned, to whose revelation the disciples react with a softer sentimentality. Most significantly, in both later versions, Christ, his disciples and the innkeeper are depicted around the table, engaged totally and exclusively in the moment of either Christ's blessing or breaking, blessing or breaking. The disciples in both paintings react expressively in recognition, while the innkeeper maintains his usual state of unawareness. There is no temporal chasm between Christ's actions and the respective reactions of the bystanders. Their responses are clear and coherent, generating no ambivalence over the moment depicted. Caravaggio's disciples react at the same time, one with a hand gesture and the other by furrowing his forehead. Equally, the subtle hand movements of reverence to disciples indicate that both have recognised Christ. Rather than depicting the figures in multiple states of awareness, as occurs in both artists' first painted versions, both have chosen a single moment of revelation um, to both disciples. This paper explores why the painters chose to convey the crucial moment of the narrative as multiple stages of realisation and acceptance in their first versions, and how the ambiguous structure of the narrative in the two early paintings mirrors and makes present to the beholder the divine mystery that is the crux of the Emmaus Gospel narrative. While Caravaggio's 1601 Supper Emmaus is grounded in, grounded in Counter-Reformation Rome, 
Rembrandt's later 1628 version, is rooted within the Reformed Protestant tradition, as Calvinism was the official faith of the Dutch Republic. The positions of the two paintings on different sides of the Western, Western religious schism, which erupted in and disrupted the 16th and 17th centuries, go some way to explain the artist's construction and dislocation of the Emmaus biblical narrative through the employment of visual and temporal ambiguities. Discrepancies between Catholic and Calvinist teachings and the importance of the sacraments have impacted the artist's construction of narrative. The Catechism of the Catholic Church institutes the existence of seven sacraments. Baptism, the Eucharist, confirmation, penance, matrimony, the holy orders, and the anointing of the sick. In his Institutes of the Christian Religion, John Calvin instead affirms only two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. While neither artist directly depicted the Last Supper, attitudes towards communion are of paramount importance to the Emmaus narrative, in which Christ replicated his actions from the Last Supper, the blessing and breaking of bread. In response to the Protestant Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church reasserted the sacramental doctrine of transubstantiation at the Ecumenical Council of Trent. The Conciliar Decrees reaffirmed transubstantiation wherein, quote, by the consecration of the bread and of the wine, a conversion is made of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord, and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. In the short treatise on the Lord's Supper, Calvin rather denies Christ's corporal, corporal presence in the bread. He sustains that the bread and wine are visible signs of Christ's body and blood, but, then trans, but that transubstantiation, quote, has no foundation in scripture, nor any evidence from the ancient church. Calvin's understanding of sacraments as visible signs accepts the bread and wine as much more than symbolic of Christ's body and blood, but rejects their physical transformation. The role of the Holy Spirit is rather emphasized, who, quote, is like a canal or channel by which all that Christ is and possesses comes down to us. The focus is therefore on a spiritual rather than physical engagement with Christ. In the Catholic tradition, Augustine acknowledged the disciples' wrong non-recognition of Christ at Emmaus as a justification for the sacramentality of the Eucharist. He instructs, Where did our Lord wish to be recognised? In the breaking of bread. It was for our sake that he didn't want to be recognised anywhere but there, because we weren't going to see him in the flesh, and yet we were going to eat his flesh. The Lord's absence is not an absence. Have faith, and the one you cannot see is with you. Augustine explained that the disciples only became one with Christ through the Eucharist. Only in the Eucharist does his presence become material. For Calvin, by contrast, the disciples' recognition of Christ was not bound to the breaking of the bread, but came about because Christ, quote, employed his peculiar and ordinary form of prayer, to which he knew that the disciples had been habitually accustomed. This suggests that it was the disciples' memory of the Lord's Supper that activated their recognition. Indeed, Calvin spoke of spiritual eating, whereby the believers, only through faith, partake in the body and blood of Christ through the intercession of the Holy Spirit. He affirmed that, quote, the flesh of Christ is eaten by believing because it is made ours by faith, and that eating is the effect and fruit of faith. The Supper at Emmaus, therefore, is not an expression of how Christ anachronistically becomes corporally present in the Eucharist, but how both this recognition of Christ is given by grace of the Holy Spirit. According to Charles Scribner, Caravaggio deliberately, deliberately removed all indicators of Christ's identity to underscore the Catholic belief in Christ's corporal identification in the Eucharist. Scribner argues that, quote, his hands have been placed in such a way that it is impossible to determine whether the wounds are there or not. Christ's face is not that of the crucified. Recognition, therefore, is a result of his gesture alone. He further links Caravaggio's non-canonical Christ to the Gospel of Mark, which recounts that Christ appeared to his disciples in another form. The Jesuit Book of Engravings, Ev Evangelicae Historiae Imaginis, from 1593, 
might have inspired Caravaggio to synthesize the Emmaus accounts of Luke and Mark. This book, which pictorially represents gospel narratives alongside meditative and explanatory inscriptions, served to evangelize and reinforce Catholic doctrine. The central scene of the Emmaus engraving depicts Christ and the disciples at a table. Christ has blessed and broken the bread. It is now being distributed. Inscribed verses from both Luke 24 and Mark 16 accompany the engraving, which is significant to Caravaggio's painting for two reasons. Firstly, it could have acted as a precedent um, for Caravaggio's pictorial synthesis of the two textual narratives. Secondly, the act of distribution of the bread foreshadows the administration of the Eucharist during Mass, highlighting again that the Emmaus narrative aims to underline the sacramentality of the Eucharist. Walter Friedlander suggests that Caravaggio was familiar with Jesuit spirituality and religious practices, particularly Ignatius of Loyola's spiritual exercises, making it possible that he was directly introduced to the Evangelicae Historiae Imaginas. Heidi Hordnick and Michael Parsons have re-emphasized how Caravaggio's representation of the scene does not wholly adhere to Luke's text, but rather he is attempted to synthesize the two gospel accounts to underscore the significance of the Eucharist. They argue that Caravaggio has specifically dislocated the moment of Christ's recognition. The sequence of Christ's actions at Emmaus, as narrated by Luke, divide, can be divided into four significant gestures. Number one, Christ takes the bread. Number two, he blesses it. Number three, he breaks it. And number four, he gives it to the disciples. The textual narrative explicitly asserts that, quote, he was known to them in the breaking of bread at Christ's third action. In Caravaggio's painting, however, Christ's hand is raised in the act of blessing. The bread beneath his left hand already appears to be broken, unlike the loaf in front of Cleopas. Caravaggio has thus ruptured the temporal progression of the narrative. Christ sim simultaneously has and still has to break the bread, while the gestures of both disciples indicate that recognition is already taking place. Judith Levy argues that Caravaggio has intentionally suspended action at this instant either before or after the blessing, because of his inability to capture the sequence of moments of the evolving narrative. She thus considers this iconographic deviation as intentional. Closer inspection, however, reveals that he has shifted the moment of recognition to one action earlier, to the act of blessing. Rather than representing the breaking of the bread as the most significant moment, which prefigures and affirms the liturgy of the Eucharist during Mass, Caravaggio has moved the painting's emphasis to the moment of consecration, where Christ becomes corporally manifest in the bread. Thus, by means of the Emmaus story, Caravaggio directly responds to the Counter-Reformation's call to reaffirm transubstantiation as a dogma of faith. That Caravaggio depicts the moment of blessing to reassert the doctrine of transubstantiation does not, however, resolve the painting's temporal and visual ambiguities. Temporal incongruity is also perceptible in the reactions of the disciples. Luke's textual narrative speaks of one critical moment of recognition in which both disciples perceived Christ's presence. In the painting, however, the disciple on the right appears to have already made that step of recognition. The figure's hands are outstretched as if in shock, yet his eyes do not appear as wide open in astonishment as Cleopas's on the left. His expression is of understanding. The position of his arms in the form of a cross purposefully suggests that he has already comprehended that it is the resurrected Christ in front of him. A further temporal gulf is thus created between the shock of his body language and the comprehending expression of his face. By contrast, Cleopas appears to fully recognize Christ. His brow is furrowed and his hands clench the chair as though he is raising himself up to behold the scene more closely. However, this is a pose of reaction rather than understanding. Caravaggio insinuates an incomplete change. 
Meanwhile, the revelation has not yet completed the full circle of the table to reach the oblivious innkeeper. Such disparity in their reactions indicates that the painting does not depict that single moment of revelation in the blessing of the bread, as suggested by Hornick and Parsons, but rather a temporal extension emerges. The effect of such temporal disjunction is that the viewer is given scope to bring Christ in the Emmaus story into the present, into the now. The sequence of reaction of the figures allows a circular, sequential narrative to form within the single canvas, rather than the suspension of action as suggested by Levy. Christ blesses the bread, the right disciple has recognised this, Cleopas is about to recognise it, and the innkeeper still has to. The only missing pictorial moment in the sequence is the present instant recognition, which corresponds to Christ's corporal manifestation in the Eucharist. Calabaja has left the reaction of Christ's manif manifestation now to the subjectivity of the viewer. Sheila McTai suggested that the fruit basket's vulnerable position on the edge of the table, quote, creates a visual parallel to the imminent change in the beholder's view. Lorenzo Pericolo further suggests that the image's close framing and centripetal structure forces viewers to ostensibly focus, quote, on their relationship to the blessing Jesus. By assuming the empty space at the table, they are encouraged to resolve the painting's ambiguities and experience for themselves the present recognition of Christ. Without the viewer's activation of the scene and the current awareness of Christ's presence, the narrative, as much as the Eucharist, remains a representation or a reenactment of an already occurred event. Thus, Caravaggio's Supper Emmaus exists not as a suspended moment, nor as a sequential narrative. The viewer's capacity to activate and reactivate the painting's narrative makes it anachronistic. In Philip Fattenker's words, quote, Caravaggio portrayed not a static moment of time as it occurred a millennium and a half before, but rather a dynamic conjunction of moments, an intersection of past, present and future that lies outside of time. Caravaggio's invitation for the viewer to understep, undertake the step of recognition for themselves is further suggested through his use of light. The different degree of illumination of the figure's faces corresponds to the state of awareness. Christ's face also appears half dark, half in shadow, half in light, reflecting the viewer's split recognition of him. The viewer can pictorially recognize the scene and its protagonists. Only the faithful, however, can perceive the true significance of the scene as an expression of Christ's corporal revelation in the Eucharist. Similar temporal and visual ambiguities characterize Rembrandt's Supper Emmaus. Christ again shares a meal with his disciples, as indicated by the pilgrim bank bag hanging on a nail above the seated figure. The rich tablecloth, the spread of food, and the innkeeper from Caravaggio's painting are, however, all missing. Instead, a silhouetted woman works in the background, replacing the traditional oblivious innkeeper. Like Caravaggio's clear pass, the seated disciple's left hand seems about to exteriorize his impending recognition while the upturned chair in the foreground indicates that the second disciple has already made this step of awareness. He kneels at Christ's feet, cloaked in complete darkness, made almost indistinguishable from Christ's silhouette itself. The position of the second figure, with his upturned feet, likely derives from Caravaggio's Madonna di Loreto and Madonna of the Rosary. The latter painting was definitely in Amsterdam around 1616 until at least 1619. Even if the young Rembrandt did not see this painting firsthand during this time, its composition would have been known to him thanks to a copy by Louis Finson, an art dealer and Caravaggio copyist. Rembrandt's potential reference to Caravaggio's needing pilgrims might suggest that his figures are not necessarily distinct portrayals of the two Emmaus disciples, but representative of all pilgrims. Indeed, in stripping back all superfluous detail to only the essential features of the bread and bowls, Rembrandt appears to simultaneously dislocate the event from necessarily occurring in an inn, while also re-emphasising it as a simple everyday scene from an inn.
This possible dislocation and casting of the disciples as ordinary seeming pilgrims brings the event more believably into the viewer's reality, granting everyone the possibility to perceive Christ spiritually, if not physically. It also underlines the reformed view of the existence of a temporal gap between Christ's revelation then and his spiritual perception now. This is achieved through Rembrandt's equally non-canonical portrayal of Christ. Christ is not depicted blessing or breaking the bread. As with Caravaggio, there is a temporal disjunction between the illuminated disciples' expression of recognition and the fact that, he, that the bread remains unbroken. Christ, rather than in action, is portrayed in profile, silhouetted by darkness. This manipulation of light heightens the ambivalence of the moment depicted, rendering it unclear whether Christ is still present, just silhouetted, or if Christ is disappearing. This stark transition from light to dark and Christ's defined profile conveys the idea of Christ's image being imprinted. Christ is a representation rather than a present embodied entity. Christ's representation becomes a sign of a referent that is elsewhere in time. It acknowledges the temporal gap between then at Emmaus and the now in front of the faithful viewer. This notion of Christ as representation harmonizes with the Calvinist belief in Christ's spiritual, not corporal, presence in the bread and re-evokes Christ's, Christ's words at the Lord's Supper, do this in remembrance of me. The breaking of bread becomes a memory of the Lord's Supper and thus Emmaus becomes a representation of that biblical event rather than a present action. This aligns with Calvin's view that the disciples only recognize Christ through their memory of him previously breaking the bread. Christ's spiritual presence and the conception of the Emmaus narrative as a memory of the Lord's Supper afar is further reinforced by Rembrandt's stark chiaroscuro and rough painting, which allows the painting to evade any realistic detail and make the narrative appear almost transient. A detailed depiction of Christ would be more akin to the Catholic notion of Christ as embodied presence. Instead, Christ submerged in darkness appears to be floating rather than anchored within the pictorial space. The ephemerality of the narrative, which asserts Emmaus and the breaking of bread as a memory of a past event, is further suggested by Rembrandt's application of paint in rough circular motions, which obstruct the vertical joints of the wall behind the central disciple. The same impastoed application of paint has created a cracking effect in the bottom right-hand corner, which interrupts the verticality of the wooden planks of the walls behind Christ. These interventions give the impression that the painting and narrative are slowly crumbling and vanishing, much like a transient memory and Christ himself after recognition. These discernible brushstrokes act to remind the viewer that Christ is spiritually perceived. Rembrandt's rough painting thus allows this dislocation into the viewer's reality without completely occluding the temporal gap between then and now. His brushstrokes serve to weave together the present with the past as a memory. It is thus clear that an understanding of the ultimate significance of the two Emmaus narratives, either as an expression of Christ's embodiment in the Eucharist, or as a channel for a spiritual communication with Christ, is contingent upon the subjectivity of the viewer. Lorenzo Pericolo argues that, quote, through its vicissitudes, the story calls upon the reader, spectator or beholder, to discover how the disrupted order is to be transfigured and reinstalled. Caravaggio's narrative sequence of recognition is only completed by the viewer, without which the scene fails to narrow the temporal gap between Christ's manifestation then and his presence now. Equally, only the viewer can reactivate Rembrandt's material stilled representation as a spiritual presence. So what triggers this viewer participation? Miki Bal explains narrative through semiotics. The story conveys itself to its recipients through signs. She proposes that, quote, a sign is it not a fixed thing, but an event, end quote which is reanimated by the subjectivity of every new viewer. Ambiguity is necessary, however, 
to stimulate the viewer's curiosity and discernment so that it can activate these signs and trigger the animation of the narrative. Baal names this ambiguity the navel, which is, quote, a metaphor for an element, often a tiny detail that hits the viewer, is processed by him or her. The navel indicates the presence of something that is not explicitly recognisable, but which subtly interacts with the viewer. Both artists' ambivalent portrayals of Christ, in which he teeters on the edge of concealment and revelation, creating temporal uncertainty and disjunction, can be identified as this navel. Although the presence of Baal's navel involves the viewer, it is not sufficient to elucidate the significance of the narrative. St. Augustine emphasized the role of faith in Christ's recognition. He asserted, quote, what you can see is bread and a cup. That's what even your eyes tell you. But as for what your faith asks to be instructed about, the bread is the body of Christ. Unless you believe, you shall not understand from Isaiah. Equally, Calvin described how the divine man, Simeon, beheld the Son of God with eyes other than the eyes of flesh. The Spirit of God illuminated his eyes by faith. Both cases reveal that Christ, for both Catholics and the Reformed, is perceived, whether physically or spiritually, through faith. The paintings themselves thus become acts of faith. Similarly, faith through the Holy Spirit is necessary for Rembrandt's viewer to animate Christ's representation as a spiritual presence. Thus, the painting's narrative structure and their visual and temporal ambiguities encourage the viewer to embark upon a path of recognition of Christ. They urge the viewer to question whether they possess the strength of faith that will lead this path to completion. Therefore, both paintings reveal themselves as apparatic artworks, a term used by Nagel and Pericolo to describe, quote, works that only generate bafflement, but that also make interdeterminacy part of the rhetorical structure. Nagel and Pericolo propose that, quote, Aporia suggests that there was once the possibility of, a, of resolution. It points out there is a way and forces us not merely to come up with a different solution. By necessity, it forces a reconsideration of the approach itself. The paintings achieve precisely this through their temporal and narrative ambiguities. Their fluctuation becomes revelation and obscurity, presence and absence, indicates the potential for resolution in which the narrative and its meaning become clarified by the viewer. Anomalies and discrepancies between the painting and textual narratives reveal that a greater tool than textual comparison is required to elucidate their meanings. Thus, the viewer is compelled to re-examine their approach and to seek another, to which faith is the only answer. Thank you for listening. I'm immensely grateful to the Dennis Mahon Foundation trustees and judging panel for choosing me as this year's Essay Prize winner.